It's five o'clock and we welcome you to this very special live Meet the Archivists. My name is Matthias Bombal and this is a very special program presented today by the Sacramento Archives Crawl, affording you an opportunity to meet some of the interesting personalities that catalog, preserve and save our local history at their various institutions. Now you may see some of them here, and if you're just joining us late, don't worry, the program will be recorded. You can play it back later if you miss it now. But if you're just joining us, allow me to please introduce some marvelous people in our community that keep this alive and wonderful. We have joining us from the Archive Record Center coordinator. She is the Archives and Record Center coordinator for the Yolo County Library. Heather Langto is joining us today. Also, we have the head of the California History Section at the California State Library. That's Sue Tyson joining us today. Hi, Sue. Sebastian Nelson is the archivist of the California State Archives. Hello, Sebastian, and thanks for joining us today. We also have Julie Thomas, who is the Instruction and Electronic Records Archivist at Sacramento State University Library. And we have with us also William Villano, the an archivist at the Center for Sacramento History. Kevin Miller joins us. He's the head of special collections and university archivist at UC Davis's Shields Library. And James Scott, the archivist of the special collections of the Sacramento Public Library, located of course in the marvelous Sacramento room at the Central Library downtown. Welcome to everybody and welcome to those of you watching us online to learn more about our archivists and our marvelous collection. So let me just begin with a, an interesting question uh, that I address to all of you. And the thing that fascinates me is this is a very specialized profession. Uh, it's not one that uh, everyone thinks about when they're a kid, you know, fireman, policeman, baseball star, football player. Uh, an archivist may not be the first thing that pops into your mind. So I wanna know how did this profession, how did this world become your world? I'm gonna start with James Scott. Yeah, thanks, Matthias, and hey, everybody. Um, so I, I started out as a librarian, actually. That's what I wanted to be. Um, <clears throat> and I started at, at SPL about 20 years ago um, and noticed this place called the Sacramento Room, um, which is, you know, basically on the second floor at Central Library downtown started to do special projects in the room as a librarian. And then over time, got to see what our archivist was up to, um, sort of the background of, of her work, um, what her interests were. Um, and, you know, bottom line, wonderful person, wonderful role model. And the, the career I found attractive, you know, it's something that I thought, I could easily transition to, um, find a lot of satisfaction, also apply um, my, my history degree. Um, and so it was a really, really great fit. Um, I went to school while I was a librarian and the Sacramento room just became a second home to me and it's where I am. And um, it affords me an opportunity to, to share the archival experience with Sacramento, um, the greater Sacramento region, and also work with great colleagues like I've got around me right here. So I'm really lucky. I think I speak for all of us in saying that it's good to be an archivist. James, one more question to dovetail that before we proceed with our other friends here in this wonderful program. And by the way, if you're viewing us at home, we will be taking your questions online. Those will get to me and I will ask the archivist on your behalf. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you, James, is what is the favorite record you might have? And by record, I don't mean a phonograph record, but asset uh, in your collection and why is it your favorite? Yeah. So that's a great question. I think um, there are uh, several just very fine, unique records that we have um, in the collection. Uh, but the one that jumps out at me is our Black Panther coloring book, um, which uh, was produced in 1968, 1969. And it is quite simply, 
straight up a coloring book that promotes the tenets of the Black Panther Party. Um, it was created in Oak Park, which we know was kind of a Northern California hub of the party. Um, and it, to me, it's expressive in so many ways. Um, the art, um, the text, and, and just the intent behind that uh, document says tons about the African-American liberation movement, um, in particular in the 1960s and 70s. Um, but it's, it's unique, it's compelling, um, it's, it's even shocking in some cases. Um, so that would be probably my favorite item that we've got in the room amongst many. Does that I'm answer? Your I, I lost your audio for a moment there. My apologies. Okay. Okay. Kevin Miller, uh, tell us about how this work became your work. And in addition, uh, what uh, are the uh, favorite items in your collection at Davis? Sure. Thanks, Matthias. So I came into archives uh, through being an academic, through being a researcher. So I have a previous um, kind of academic life as an ethnomusicologist. So I studied anthropology and music. And uh, that was my first graduate degree. And in the course of doing that work and some of the internships and, uh, and work associated with it, I was constantly sort of dipping my toes into uh, sound archives, music archives, um, the, the archive um, at the Smithsonian Institution that supports uh, Smithsonian Folkways recordings, for example, uh, seeing, you know, handwritten uh, poems and song lyrics by Woody Guthrie. It's got me very excited about um, how this material is preserved and made accessible. Uh, and so um, even though there was a great uh, component of field work to my work, uh, the work that I did in museums and libraries and archives um, was just really titillating to me. And so um, just sort of taking that love of discovery uh, of something very unique, uh, something that hasn't been surfaced um, very much or something that you've kind of made your own through your own original research was just really exciting for me. And so um, knowing that I didn't want to become a, a full-time professor, um, I immediately rolled into the library school program at UCLA and got a degree in library science. And by that time I developed a more general interest in academic archives. Uh, I love photography. Um, I've, I've always um, enjoyed um, the handwritten manuscripts, uh, diaries, things that really tell a story. Uh, and so uh, from there, um, um, you know, I, I just kind of went into archives and never went back. Um, and so kind of related to that, a favorite item, um, you know, like James, this is a really tough question, uh, so many things to choose between. But what came to mind for me um, was, um, you know, at UC Davis, we focus a lot on grapes and wine, uh, among other areas of agriculture. Uh, and so um, one of our um, one of uh, our really exciting collections to come in over the last few years was the research archives of, of the Wine Institute, which is based in San Francisco. This is a decades old organization that has been sort of regulating and promoting the wine industry in California uh, for decades. And so, um, uh, you know, in looking through that material, and I'm not, I don't do the processing myself um, as an administrator, but I love to get my hands on the material. I'm, I'm usually in the field, bringing it in, taking notes. I don't think I could do this job if I wasn't able to be in touch with the material. Um, so there was this one folder that was called Wine Queens and uh, you open it up and that's what it is. So it's basically from the 1950s forward. It was um, promotional photographs of women, sometimes in two piece bathing suits with sashes that say Wine Queen. <laughs> it was ways to promote uh, the wine industry, you know, using sex, maybe sexism. And it was like all in one folder was this entire story. You know, it was, it was the photographs, it was the, um, the outreach, the applications from individual women, uh, the, the things they had to fill out. It was the contractual agreements with these models about how they couldn't get a haircut or had to look a certain way, uh, had to remain within a certain weight. Um, it was sort of how it changed over time. You know, in the seventies, you know, the, the wine queens start to be business owners you know, as well, and not, not just um, a pretty face, if you will. 
and uh, and then also internal memos at, at the institute saying, you know, this this idea is getting kind of old. It's kind of running up against women's lib. Uh, so just this whole story in one folder, you know, that talks about uh, you know the the, the role that um, that this kind of promotion had in terms of gender uh, in the wine industry was really interesting. And so it just, you know, the researcher in me gets really excited when I see things like that. Thanks, Kevin. How about you, Sebastian? Uh, tell us about the California State Archives where you're at and how did this profession, this inclination, this vocation become your vocation? And what do you particularly enjoy in the collection at the California State Archives? Yeah, sure. So here at the State Archives, we're a division within the office of the Secretary of State of California. And we have historic records from state agencies, the governor's office, state courts, and the state legislature. My path to becoming an archivist was kind of roundabout. Um, I finished graduate school in history, but I knew I didn't want to be a teacher because I wouldn't be a good teacher. Um, and I was living in San Jose at the time. So I thought, you know what, I could defer re paying my student loans if I went back to school. So I ended up going to San Jose State's then called School of Library and Information Science to get a library degree. This was when they had in-person classes. Um, there were different career tracks. You could take classes to become a university librarian or an archivist or whatever. And it seemed to me that all of the program tracks except archives were very heavy. There's a very great heavy emphasis on computers and computer technology. And I'm not a big computer person, so I took the archives track, even though I thought, you know, number wise, there's more librarian positions in the country than archivist positions. So I thought I'd probably end up being a librarian nonetheless. However, when I graduated in 2007, I saw there was a job opening at the California State Archives. And I thought, you know what, if I go through the process of having the job interview, that in and of itself would be good experience. But since I have no job experience, I had no expectations that they would offer me the position or hire me. So I went into the interview with absolutely no fear and did really, really well. And they said, would you like the job? And I was like, this is exciting. This is great. Where's Sacramento again? Um, and it's been about 14 and a half years and I'm still here and it's an honor to work here. Um, really quickly, probably my, it's difficult to say what my favorite item is in our collection, but we do have a lot of records of Californians who fought during the American Civil War. And specifically, that was the first time in California that Californians could cast a ballot by mail. They, the first time they could vote by mail. And we have records of California troops fighting as far away as uh, Virginia against the Confederacy. And there's one ballot with a write-in ballot where the soldier had actually indicated that they wanted the governor to be Emperor Norton, who was a famous eccentric from San Francisco. So I think if I had to choose one item, it'd probably be that one. <laughs> what about you, Heather Langto at the Yolo County Archives? Tell us uh, what uh, brought you into this fold and what you love about your particular collection, one item. So thank you, Matthias. And actually I'm really happy that I'm going after Kevin and Sebastian because I have a similar, similar record type that I like and also a similar path to Kevin. So. I um, came to archives by way of a history graduate degree, actually music history. Um, and in that graduate work, I spent a lot of time in archives, um, mostly in archives in Chicago. And then um, actually in my graduate program there, I started working in the archives and special collections at my alma mater at University of Oregon. And so I kind of got the, um, the end user experience as a researcher and then also got some experience on the um, archives processing side, which I think is really exciting. And um, the whole idea of making um, archival records more accessible, and I think definitely having that researcher perspective, you can you can really apply that on the back end and, and see, okay, I know as a researcher, this is how I wanted to be able to find things, and this is how it was useful to me. And so to be able to kind of work both sides of that world was really interesting. Um, so then I went to San Jose State as well. I did that degree program online and worked full time in archives and libraries at the same time that I was doing the degree and then made my way back to uh, California to work at the Yolo County Archives. Um, the archives at Yolo County is the official repository for county records. Um, and we have, our collection goes back to about 1850, but the bulk is 1860 to 1960. Um, so again, we have records that were created by county departments. And then we also do collect um, historical records from families and, and things of that nature. 
Um, my favorite record type. Um, it's so hard as you guys were saying things, I was like, oh yeah, we have similar things that I also think are interesting. But I really like um, the records that are created by the court system. So um, one record type in particular that I really like is um, probate. But one, I wanted to talk about one specific finding that I found um, just in the civil records. And um, there was a civil case back during the Civil War period where somebody was uh, reprimanded and there was actual court case that was filed against him because he was making some kind of brouhaha in a saloon and he was pledging allegiance to the Confederacy and Jefferson Davis. And so I thought that was really interesting because we, I feel like majority of people see us as more of a, you know, we are aligned with the union and it's, it's not so a lot of people from um, that ended up in Yolo County were actually from the South. So um, that's my, my favorite record. Well, thanks so much, Heather. And we have some questions coming in. Keep sending them to us, but we're going to get through our introductions of our panelists before we begin addressing the questions. But please don't stop asking, and we are getting them. I have them all lined up and ready to ask these fine individuals. We move now to Sue Tyson with the uh, California State Library. Sue, thank you so much for joining us. And tell us about how it was that you arrived at the California State Library. What was the impetus for that? And what do you especially like in your collection? Okay, so I also have a circuitous route. Uh, I got a PhD in German studies and had sort of my first real brush with primary source material in writing my dissertation um, in Berlin and dusty archives, reading old uh, literary cultural journals. Um, but I decided that I did not wanna be a professor of German studies and bailed out of academia, bounced around um, several careers and then ended up as a librarian at USC. Um, and while I was doing that, I had wonderful subject liaison fields in um, US history and African-American studies, Asian-American studies, Native American studies, the American West. My, um, all of the people that I worked with as a subject liaison started becoming really interested in primary sources and took me right along with them. I just, I developed a fascination that did not go away. Um, I came to see primary source material as one of the best ways to really have a critical engagement with history where you're really looking at something and saying, how in the world, what in the world was responsible in history for the way that they were framing this issue. I always would urge students to look at our own period through those eyes, you know, like you're watching TV. What in the world were they thinking about public health care, for example? <laughs> I mean, we will be looked at that way. Um, so I had gone to San Jose State, like other people, to get my library degree. Um, I decided to change careers to special collections and archives and went to UCLA and um, you know, took all kinds of courses in archives and special collections, and then bounced around between many, many different institutions as a project archivist, um, and then ended up at the State Archives working with Sebastian, and then uh, went from there into the State Library where I've been for just over a year. Um, and one of my favorite things in, um, our collection, it has not yet been processed. So this is not yet out in the world, um, but we have a wonderful drawer of posters created by the um, Royal Chicano Air Force that the artistic uh, art collaborative and collective, they are fascinating, they're beautiful, they're amazing. I know that um, Sac State has a lot of them, Santa Barbara has a lot of them. Um, they were silk screeners. They, they were active not only as artists, but um, as a collective in all sorts of uh, areas of society. One of my favorite things in reading about them is just one of the members ran an auto repair shop. You know, there are a lot of times, um, you know, things, similarities with like the Black Panthers. There was a, a breakfast program and I just, I find them absolutely fascinating. I've loved the mural in Southside Park that was created by RCAF members. Um, ever since I discovered it in moving back to Sacramento, I can't believe we have such amazing artwork just there in Southside 
park and in these posters, it's just fascinating. They're from the 70s um, through the 80s. Just all the different kinds of engagement with Southside Park, for example, that they had or with legal education or with Sac State students and art exhibits and things like that. And to me, that kind of really deeply engaged with society artwork is so fascinating and really necessary right now. So I'll stop. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Sue. Uh, now we're going to look at uh, William Villano. William, you're at the Center for Sacramento History, and it's a lovely institution. I've spent a lot of time there myself. Tell me how you got within those doors and the path that led you in this area and what you particularly like in that massive collection there off of uh, Richards Boulevard. Well, just like everyone else, I never started on the path to becoming an archivist. I started... Um... As a historian, I earned my master's degree in US history and culture, and I spent hundreds and hundreds of hours studying in the library, special collections, and archives in New York City. One of my focuses in cultural history was print, print history, particularly looking at American magazines and cartooning. As I was finishing up my master's thesis, my thesis advisor said to me, hey, I just got this email from a collector who says he's got an entire room full of old magazines. Uh, I took a job with that gentleman, and it turns out that he has around 400 things that are completely unique and one of the most extensive privately held collections in the world. Um, for his United We Stand collection, which was from World War II and you know, really trying to drum up patriotism, he's second only to the Smithsonian. Unfortunately, all of this stuff was kept in the home of a neurologist and no one had access to it. <laughs> so I worked with him for about six years. I put together a tremendous digital archive for him. And then from there, I said, you know, I'm really, really enjoying this stuff because to me, one of my focuses was you know, the historic profession should be able to provide primary source materials directly to the people. So you can look at it yourself without going through the lens of a historian. Now, you know, many historians are terrific and they do a great job pulling everything together and doing interpretation. But to me, there's just something special about being able to see the raw artifacts of history and saying, oh, that's what it means. Okay, that's what it looked like. That's how people saw and felt at the time. So from there, I went to the State University of Albany in their library and information sciences program. I did an internship at the FDR library, and then I worked as a contract and private archivist for a number of years. Then about two and a half years ago, I decided to come over to California because I didn't like the snow as much. And I've been here ever since. Now at the Center for Sacramento History, I have to say my favorite collection is probably um, the photographic collection of a gentleman named U Eugene Hepting. Now what Mr. Hepting had done is travel around to every street corner in Sacramento and take a picture. <laughs> so with that whole collection put together as a solid corpus of records, we end up essentially having Google Maps from the 1930s and 40s. <laughs> and it's fascinating just to say, oh, that's what it looked like, or to show people their house from 1942 when they said, oh, look how small that tree was in our front yard. Uh, so, you know, being able to really connect people with the past in that manner is just uniquely rewarding for me. Well, thank you very much, William. And now we move on to Julie Thomas at Sacramento State University. Hi, Julie. You know the question by now. We saved, the, we saved you for last. How did you get into it? What was the impetus? And what do you especially enjoy at uh, Sacramento State's collection? Okay, thank you. Thanks for asking the question. Um, kind of like everybody else, I didn't start out on the career path of uh, being an archivist. Um, when I got my undergrad degree in 1985, um, you didn't get a degree always to get a job. You got a degree to be educated. So, hence why I was a history major, an ancient and medievalist, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so after I graduated, I bounced around for 10 years doing all kinds of work, but I realized it wasn't my calling. So I did some research on various jobs, starting with don't wear a suit. You don't have to wear a suit. And I found archives and um, surveying. And it took me about a minute to make a phone call and realize archives is the way to go. So uh, I'm from Chicago. I went to one of the best programs in the country, the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. 
and I got both a history, a master's in history, a master's in library science, and never looked back. I started out as a corporate archivist at Motorola, went to a museum at Chicago History Museum, and then ended up here in academic archives, where I've been for almost 19 years. And um, I'm going to cheat on the answer to <laughs> what's my favorite item, because it's like asking a parent to say, well, who's your favorite child? I can't do it. It's whatever box I've opened up or I'm looking at, <laughs> that is my favorite. Um, as I was listening to the responses of my colleagues, I was like, yes, our Civil War diary. Oh, yes, our Black Panther speech by Eldridge Cleaver. Oh, yes, the RCAF <laughs> post our poster collection. So everything is, is special and unique. Um, and whatever speaks to the researcher or student coming in and they can use it or they get something from it, that's my favorite at the time. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. Now you've met our panelists for this live Meet the Archivists, part of the Sacramento Archive Crawl, and we have a nice long list of questions that I will begin to address the panelists, and then whoever of them indicates to me they'd like to answer, we will take them one at a time in response to the questions. A reminder that this will be uh, recorded and you can watch it uh, at a later time, and of course, uh, we are so delighted you're joining us today to meet some of the faces behind keeping our history alive. As Marsha Eyman once told me at the Center for Sacramento History, I love quoting her on this, uh, history happens every day. And we don't think of history occurring in our own time. We always think of it something remotely in the past. And the fact that something that is uninteresting now uh, might indeed be quite fascinating for some archivists 50 years from now, 100 years from now, and for reasons we cannot imagine today. So I think it's a fascinating thing to keep the curiosity alive and vibrant. So I'm now going to go to our first question, which comes from Sarah Schwartz, who asks, do you think the archival community is sufficiently diverse? And if not, how can we bring in more diverse workers? Okay, James Scott. Okay, unmuted. So um, that is a very important question um, for not only um, our occupation, but also for society. And quite simply, the answer is no. Um, we, we are lacking diversity in a lot of different ways. Um, I can say from a library standpoint, um, you know, we're a special collection slash archive within a library. Um, the Sacramento Public Library is working really, really hard to um, combat white supremacy and trying to sort of tear down sort of that dominant paradigm uh, within library science and the perception of what the librarian is. One of the, the challenges I have in the Sacramento room um, is that when you walk in, it is quite beautiful. But if you're not accustomed to an East Coast style reading room um, that would be primarily accessible to higher class folk, you're automatically going to feel alienated. And so the best way uh, to sort of sort of break down that barrier, at least in my eyes, is to diversify our collection, have more own voice uh, titles and resources, and then also try to have own voice art, own voice in the sense that this is content created by a diversity of Sacramentans, Californians, whatever. Um, just to sort of wrap things up, I know that the library sciences have been confounded for decades with this very question. Um, literature has been written. Um, how do we break down these barriers and how do we bring all Americans into the occupation? And I think it really comes down to what we do at the micro level. I think archival outreach is a huge component to how we diversify our occupation. Um, reaching out to schools, bringing schools into archives, which in this 
day and age is not the easiest thing to do, but getting to kids early and sort of creating an environment or building a bridge whereby they can see themselves doing what we do um, within our profession. So um, that's my take, but we've got a lot of work to do. Thanks, James. How about Sue Tyson at the California State Library? Unmute here. Um, I'll definitely, um, I agree with what James said. I also think um, it's really important that the archives um, profession examine the jobs that it offers people. Um, precarity is really the word to describe archival jobs. So I mentioned that I bounced around between multiple project jobs. Um, often you have to volunteer in order to even get a job. In fact, when I switched careers, I was told, well, you're not going anywhere in this job until you volunteer, until you have some way or another two years experience. Well, how do you get that? Um, I was able to volunteer. Not everybody can. Um, I was able to do internships. Not everybody can. Um, and then once you finish your education, I took several project jobs, meaning, you know, you're employed for a year or 14 months, or maybe they'll renew you, or maybe they won't. And some of these positions don't offer any benefits or anything like this. I did, but I always thought of mine as truncated professional. I had full insurance. I got to go to conferences, but it's like, but after 14 months, uh, and I would say to people, you know, well, what are, you know, so I've processed this collection. Are you going to find me under a bridge and ask me a question about it later? You know, I mean, <laughs> I had so many sleepless nights. Um, finally, I thought, you know, I'm, where's a permanent job? I'm going to apply for this a state job, which is how I ended up at the archives. Um, that in itself is also an issue because there is an art to taking a state exam. <laughs> so I think employment uh, situations really need to be addressed um, if more people are going to be able to come into the field because the precarity is just not acceptable. Thank you, Sue. How about Julie Thomas at Sacramento State? Okay, uh, thank you again. Is uh, undeniably, there is a uh, shameful lack of diversity, um, but it's not through um, because of exclusive, you know, we haven't been excluding people. Um, it's a matter of that it is such a specialized field and what how I combat it um, or try to ameliorate it is I'm in a position as an instructor, uh, especially with a lot of freshmen is to proactively identify students who are who um, are uh, interested who uh, engaged with it and sacramento state is an incredibly diverse university so i have literally taken people you know students under my wings mentor them other students who have any interest i tell them to find mentorships or, or you know mentors uh, who can help them and guide them so that they don't fall into the pitfall that Sue did, where you need experience to get a job, but you can't get a job with that experience. With a mentor and with somebody facilitating and guiding you, networking, you're going to get, I'd like to think, that experience. And um, I have fortunately have been able to, mend, uh, to mentor a number of BIPOCs students and um, there are other things that I think can be done as an industry but right now we can only do what we can do as individuals and write articles about it saying <laughs> it's time for a change what's working isn't working thanks Julie okay Heather Langto yeah so I just kind of wanted to I mean what everybody has said is absolutely correct um, but I wanted to amplify a little bit of what James was saying and I think that really it's us getting into schools and meeting students at a younger age, because like you mentioned in the beginning, Matthias, I mean, and you saw in all of our introductions, none of us were in elementary school thinking that we wanted to be archivists. We didn't know it was a profession. We didn't even know it existed. So I think that that's one of our jobs as um, individuals that are already in the profession 
Um, and again, it kind of comes back to what Sue was saying too about the precarity of our jobs and the lack of resources. Um, you know, it's one of the things that I think is really important, but perhaps there's not enough hours in the day or people to do that kind of outreach. But I do think it's one of the most important things that we can do. And that's to really engage with students, help to promote primary source literacy and try to meet students where they are and not necessarily have to have them come into our facilities um, because that's also a barrier. Kevin Miller. Yeah, um, I'll be brief. I think we could easily spend the entire uh, seminar on this. Um, it's such an important issue. Uh, but just an example of the kind of micro change that James mentioned. Uh, so, uh, and also following Sue's comments, which I thought were really important. Um, so in the job descriptions uh, that we put out uh, and the job requirements in particular, that's, that's an area where we need to revisit uh, what we're writing there. So coming up with job requirements that still attract uh, candidates that can do the job, but, but valuing other kinds of experiences, other routes to education uh, will expand the pool uh, of applicants quite a bit um, and, and hopefully diversify that pool as well. Thanks very much, Kevin. We have a, a direct question for Sebastian Nelson. You're on the spot, Sebastian. The question comes from Jenny and she asks, when will the archives research room reopen to the public? As a regular user of the archives, she writes, I'm grateful for the efforts made during the pandemic closures, but receiving copies in the mail is not the same thing as being able to review documents in the beautiful and spacious research room. Thanks. Well, thank you for the question. Yes, unfortunately, like many archives and libraries, um, the California State Archives has been closed to the public for about a year and a half uh, now due to the pandemic. Um, we're still closed to the public, and unfortunately, I do not have any information about our reopening or the timeline for that. Um, so I do um, appreciate your patience. One thing I can recommend, you may have already done this, but if you do email the State Archives, um, our email address is archivesweb at sos.ca.gov. It's my understanding that there's a list we maintain of people that we are going to contact once that reopening information does become available. And I definitely agree with you. There is no substitute for hands-on dealing with the records. Thanks, Sebastian. A question has come in now from Nathaniel. And he writes, I'm looking into an MLIS grad program with a focus on archives. I'm concerned about gaining employment post-grad as I've yet to have any experience working in archival or library settings. Do you think volunteer internship opportunities offered within grad programs would be enough? How would you suggest I get started in working in archives? Uh, William. Hi, Nathaniel. Um, so first off, it depends on which program you get to join and where you would like to um, intern at. So there are quite a number of different archival archetypes. There's academic archives, public archives, government archives. So your first step might be to say, well, what do I want out of this? What environment do I want to work in? And from there, if you can get a really good internship, it will most certainly help quite a bit. There are a large number of archival jobs out in the world, but the quality of your education and the internships that you get will help, um, particularly if you can get hands-on experience with archival materials. Um, you know, it's a bit of a catch-22 right now with a lot of uh, digital archival programs where, you know, yes, you're learning the profession, but after two years, you may have never actually touched archival material, which does give some uh, hiring agents, it, you know, a little bit of pause. I was lucky enough at my internship at the FDR library to process the papers of uh, Rudolf Erba, who was a Czechoslovakian Jew who escaped from Auschwitz and is credited as telling the world about the Holocaust. So when I can sit down and interview and say something like that, you know, it kind of bumps me up to the top of the list. So a lot of it depends on where you want to end up working in the profession. There are you know, quite a few jobs, but I would say try to find something where you can get that hands-on experience, processing experience, and really say, yes, I know how to handle old fragile materials. Yes, I understand how relevant these items are to people's identities, because at the end of the day, a lot of what we work with is the raw artifacts of our very culture. 
Julie Thomas, what can you tell Nathaniel? Unmute your microphone, Julie. Okay. Uh, yeah, go. this isn't work necessarily for everybody, but what I recommend is focusing in on areas that you're passionate about. There are so many different aspects to the work of an archivist. Um, and the days when you were a full service archivist are pretty much past. So you can find something that speaks to your passion. Is it working with electronic records? Is it working with the public? Is it working with a certain format uh, like audiovisual or prints or certain subjects, Grateful Dead archives or wine archives? You can find all these different opportunities. You just have to get that experience, whether not whether through internships, volunteering, through educational opportunities and just focus on that and eventually it'll become it'll it'll come to you you just have to be prepared to you know start at the bottom and work your way up heather what do you say to our friend nathaniel hey nathaniel um i do have one other suggestion it's similar to what julie was talking about but I would actually recommend looking at job descriptions and see what the uh, profession is asking you to know. And then I would um, be your own advocate when you go out to ask for volunteering opportunities. I know internships are often quite specific, but for volunteering opportunities, if you're looking at job descriptions and maybe you don't really know the profession super well yet, if there are certain um, abilities that those job descriptions are asking you to have, I would approach a volunteer opportunity and ask if you can do those type of tasks in your volunteering, and then that'll help prepare you for jobs as well. And Sue, you have uh, some advice for Nathan. Yeah, I was going to say, um, look at carefully at the programs too, um, because one advantage, of course, of online programs is that you can work um, and you can work quite a bit and take on different kinds of um, opportunities. You know, see if maybe you can also investigate hybrid programs where you're meeting some, you know, doing um, some stuff in person, but also some things um, online. And then, yeah, it's really hands-on experience. I would say go for a wide range of experience, follow your interests, like People have said, and also don't be afraid to do things like contribute to discussion, you know, find lists to join, ask questions, write articles if you like to write, um, you know, get to know people. Most people do want to talk about this. They were obviously not in this for the money. We're in it out of the fascination <laughs> and because we think it's important. And generally, you know, we want to talk about this stuff. Um, and that can really help. That can lead to very things you might not have even thought of at all. Um, and I, I like what Julie was talking about, really how each box that you she opens is sort of her favorite. <laughs> in a way, just, just keep opening boxes in a larger metaphorical sense, because you will actually learn so much in this job. You might not have any idea eight months from now, like what your fascination and obsession of the moment will be, <laughs> you know? So be prepared to be barking up lots of trees and staying up some of them, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> James Scott. Yeah, just, just really uh, quickly, um, another metaphor, just keep chopping wood. If, it, if it's what you love doing, if, if it's what you aspire to, just keep doing it. And, and I have no em empirical evidence or analysis to throw your way, other than the fact that I think heritage institutions are strong, they're well supported. Um, I think the general public, based on my experience, and I think based on the experience of my colleagues, um, really embraces the past and finds it to be, uh, you know, a bit of sanctuary during a time of social media overload, uh, zeros and ones spinning around our heads. I think there's always going to be support and a market for 
um, archives, museums, special collections. So um, congratulations on your degree and uh, keep looking at archives and keep looking at special collections. Thanks. Sue Lyon. Are you there, Sue? Sue, you had your hand up. Were you going to say something oh, else? Oh, Tyson. <laughs> Tyson, excuse me. Oh, no problem. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add um, one thing that is always sort of providing an opening to people too, is that the way that history is looked at is always changing. So one example um, that I, I saw an amazing uh, presentation on critical family history. So. I personally have not been so interested in genealogy, but what this person did, she's written a book on this. I forget her name, unfortunately, um, but basically looking at genealogy within a historical context. So rather than, you know, my grandparents came over and did it themselves, you know, they pulled themselves up by their bootstraps, actually looking at one's family history within the context of society who was in the minority, who was being um, privileged and who punished by the various um, environment, you know, the contexts in which they, you know, made their way through the world. That to me is sort of an expression of how new voices, fresh thinking are always welcome in primary sources. Um, and so if you, please come in and contribute because um, there, there, there's always room for new thinking. Thank you, Sue Tyson. Now, Sarah Schwartz asked a question, uh, but you've already answered the first part of it. So I'm going to go on to the next part, which is something that I don't want you all to incriminate yourself by answering. And that is, what are the pros and cons to working within an institution? James Scott. Yeah, so um, over the last 18 months or so, um, one of the challenges of working in an archive, special collections has been maintaining contact with our users and with the general community. And I've seen other institutions um, work nimbly um, with their social media dimension. Um, I, I can look directly to my friends over at the Center for Sacramento History with their Facebook presence um, and in particular Instagram. Um, I'm so jealous. I'm so jealous. Now, why am I bringing this up? I'm bringing this up because I, I work for a bit more of a monolithic sort of agency where it's, it's tough to have that sort of flexibility um, and turn on a dime sort of spirit. Um, and so that is a challenge I find as um, a, a heritage institution or, um, or collection that has had a really hard time reaching out through social media. Um, there is a definite sort of chain of command with these things. So, um, but it's been great to see how my, you know, my colleagues and other institutions have just been amazing with reaching out via social media, not only keeping their, their standard researchers, but finding new ones because obviously everyone became really, really good at social media over the last 18 months. So. With us, not so much. Thanks, James. How about Kevin Miller? Thanks. Um, so, I mean, pros obviously is you know great infrastructure, fair amount of resources. Um, I happen to work at UC Davis, which is an institution that um, I feel very comfortable and at home working in. In terms, you know, we have our principles of community, the library. Uh, is working on a strategic plan that focuses on, um, on diversity at its core. And so I feel very good about where I am. That hasn't always been the case in my career in terms of other places I've worked. So I'm very happy to be where I am. Uh, there's a great set of colleagues uh, work, you know, built in, um, great community here. Um, 
but just things to be mindful of, you know, um, from where I sit, um, you know, the work that I do as the head of this department is kind of, um, it's, it's a mixture of firm budget money, but also a lot of soft money. And so there's a, a, a great amount of outreach uh, to the donor community. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we're aligning uh, with, you know, partners in the community and individuals where that share our collection development goals. And so wanting to make sure that we, we work with soft money in a way that drives our mission uh, and not the other way around. And so it's always a little bit tricky, uh, but it's, it's so far it's been very you know, positive uh, on the whole. Um, you know, uh, and I don't have a lot of great examples of this, but of course, any large institution that's, you know, will have a regional reputation, will have the um, relationships that pre exist you at that particular place. Uh, and so you might be coming into, uh, you know, communities um, and dealing with, um, you know, um, prior experiences where maybe your institution has a reputation or your predecessor did something or didn't do something. And so that's always, um, you know, potentially a challenge. Um, so I think I'll leave it, leave it there. Thanks, Kevin. William. So for me, the most obvious benefit of working in an institution is we've got the stuff. <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> uh, it, whether you're at a government archive, an academic archive or a library, there are going to be existing collections. Most of the time, someone will have been there before you. So you're not, you know, always just starting from scratch. And a lot of the materials we have, you can't possibly get anywhere else. You, I know several of our institutions have court records. You're not gonna find those in anyone's private collections and the amount of information you have is going to be very, very hard for anyone to duplicate. To me, one of the other great benefits is the focus on getting it out to people, on that sense of public service, on bringing people's history and culture directly to them. Um, you know, the only thing that I would like to say a little more about being a private archivist would be um, you get to negotiate your own salary and price, which sometimes can be very good. Um, you know, it is a difficult field to break into. A lot of the times you have to find someone who can A, hire an archivist and B, have something worth archiving. Now, in my experience from the area I was in in New York, those people who wanted to hire someone to work full time and had stuff worth preserving were generally very wealthy families. So the salary was nice, but it was always a little inconsistent at times. Um, if you were interested in becoming a private archivist and finding jobs that would work uh, outside of institutions, there's a number of um, of firms that work specifically with that. There's also a resource from the Society of American Archivists. They have an independent archivist section. You may want to look into that. Shameless plug, I was uh, the founder of the section, so it really is a great section. <laughs> Uh, William, you brought up something that uh, touched on a question that I had, which I think is really uh, right at the, at the key of what you just mentioned to us all, and that is uh, basically uh, what determines what is historic or worth saving? I'll, I'll hop right in there. So there's a the number of criteria. One is... Um evidentiary value, like I mentioned, court records. Sometimes there's a legal requirement to keep those records. We have a number of um, engineering and architectural records at the Center for Sacramento History and the people who built and maintain our bridges, they want to know what was done before. But for most institutions, there is a collections committee where we get together a number of individuals and, and essentially vote based on pre-existing criteria. It does it fit with our collection? Would it fit better with someone else's collection? Can we possibly preserve this or would we not be able to do that? So one of the really interesting things about having a collections committee is that it takes uh, the power away from a certain individual that just says, this is history, I'm telling you what's history and I'm imposing myself on it. By having a number of people all get together, discuss it and vote, you can get a, a wider berth of experiences, of values, and of viewpoints that say, hey, this is important, here's why. 
Let's see, we have uh, Julie Thomas with some input on this. Okay, um, thanks. Uh, yeah, determining what's historic is usually at the discretion of the archivist who's collecting material, as William was saying, around our collecting scope. And what that means is we collect specific material. There's no archives out there saying, we'll take anything. So, for example, we're the home of the Japanese American Archival Collection, and I've had archivists from the Center for Sacramento History call me and say, we were offered this donation, but we know it belongs with you. And I'm out in the community actively seeking material. On the other hand, I know that the Center collects Gold Rush material and early Sacramento founding stuff. If somebody offers it to me, I wouldn't take it because we don't collect it, it would go to the center. So we follow our clearly stated and thoughtfully created what is it we want to collect. And then as, as archivists, we decide this is historic. And people are many times surprised mm -hmm. when we say, oh, yes, this is historic, what you have. We want it. Of course, uh, space is a great issue of concern, too. But let's go to uh, Kevin Miller. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, you know, I think determining what's interesting now, as you said a little while ago, Matthias, um, can sometimes be obvious, like the pandemic. I think we all kind of rushed to collect things around that. Um, the hard part is determining what's not interesting now that will be interesting later, right? Uh, but I also wanted to mention, um, as been mentioned before, uh, that, you know, we as, as archivists, you know, have, all have a lot of in inherent bias uh, in terms of our, what we collect. We all work in institutions that grew um, out of systemic racism. And so I think, you know, divorcing that power from the individual is, is a great idea as um, William was describing, um, but also a, a kind of a post-custodial approach to archival work is, is I think a really interesting area that takes different forms. That's more of a consultation that's working with communities who have material that might uh, come to the archive, but it also might not. It might be working with them to perhaps scan and return and then present digital surrogates online. Uh, it might be consulting with, with the community on how they can maintain their own material. Um, I can't claim to have done an excellent job on this, but it's an area that we want to grow. My colleague, Jason Sarmiento at the Bulusan Center for Filipino Studies here at UC Davis has been doing an excellent job at this. Uh, and so I encourage anyone to talk to him about a model for how a post-custodial archiving could work in uh, cultural communities. Thanks, Kevin. Heather Langto. Yeah, and I was just going to mention, um, in addition to what already has been talked about here, is the process of collections management is an ongoing thing. So something that may have been identified as relevant, important, um, you may, a, an archivist may come in 50 years down the road, be reevaluating collections and realize, ooh, this really doesn't fit within the scope or we thought that this would be historically relevant, but maybe it's not. And similar to what Julie was saying, you know what, this actually fits better at another repository. And then we can go through what's called a deaccessioning process and move collections to better facilities, better, better institutions where either they will have relevance, they can be viewed um, alongside other collections that are more relevant to that specific collection. So it's really an, on, an ongoing non-static thing, collections management. Sue Tyson. Yeah, I, I wanted to echo that, that um, that's always under evaluation or should be. Um, collection scope, what is historically important, also a, a deep awareness of silence. What has been silenced in the record? What was never deemed worth collecting in the first place? Um, for example, women's history in the 19th century, you know, I mean, new, new areas um, in collecting are being addressed all the time or should be. Um, new areas of fascination or, you know, suddenly people realize that what was considered completely ephemeral is actually how a culture depicts itself and is actually really crucial to collect. Um, you know, so um, silenced voices, that's a topic that people do talk about in archival collections. And that's a, a really crucial discussion. 
Now, I'll have another question for you, Sue, in just a moment. I just want to remind people that you're watching live Meet the Archivist, part of the Sacramento Archives Crawl. Now, this was supposed to be a Zoom session of only an hour, and we've just hit that. So I want to ask our wonderful panel if they'd like to stay on with us and answer the rest of the wonderful questions that have come in. Is that agreeable to you all? Outstanding. Well, then we'll continue. And uh, a question we have next, and we wanted to start with Sue and then have the rest of you chime in with your own thoughts. Uh, one of our fellow archivists have asked, uh, since we have different things in our archives, how do all of the institutions work together to help researchers? Well, um, I am a big believer in research not being one-stop shopping. So I think um, when I'm trying to work with people, I try to actually stress that. If you're working on a particular topic, we may have a wonderful set of materials um, to explore, but chances are we are not gonna be the whole story. And I just think of something like, for example, if you're talking about um, water, I don't know, the history of water in California, right? So we're gonna have certain things. We will have books, we'll have photographs, we'll have manuscript collections, maybe of some great water resource person. But I will also say, go over to the state archives and get some agency histories of, you know, how the state dealt with water issues. And I might say, go over to Sac State or UC Davis and see if you can find academic treatments of water that are showing up in some way or another. I would also say, go to the Sac Public Library and the Center for Sacramento History to get a local take on water issues and the effects, for example, of flooding or um, any number of things and same with Yolo County. So, um, you know, questions are, I think um, I've taught a lot of college. I've taught a lot of students and a lot of, and I've had a lot of people say, I just need the top, I just need a primary source. Just give me whatever the top of whatever you find or the, you know, first two choices. And it's like, no, real research, you need to delve. You know, <laughs> you need to think about it and you're gonna have to go and actually explore a bunch of different angles and read a bunch of stuff. And you're actually probably gonna love it. Maybe in, even in spite of your deadline or yourself. <laughs> Thanks, Sue. Uh, Heather. Well, I just wanted to shamelessly plug things like this, <laughs> like the Sacramento Archives Crawl, because I feel like doing projects like this where we all come together in our regional repositories and we create a theme and we talk about the types of materials we have that relate to that theme and the community gets to do kind of a one-stop shop in four different areas under normal circumstances or engage with us virtually you know, for a week out of the year and learn about all the different ways that we can address certain topics. I think that this kind of work is really important um, to sort of introducing people into how you can get at different research topics at the various institutions around the area. Thanks, Heather. James. Yeah, thanks, Matthias. I just wanted to, to quickly say that there's something special about Sacramento in particular. Um, if you are an archivist, um, and that includes Yolo County and, and Davis, um, a city like Sacramento being a company town, right? As as a, a place where there's state government and all these great, you know, uh, agencies that have repositories. You've got these big institutions, and yet at the same time, it's small enough to where we do have things like the Sacramento Archives crawl. Um, we we do have an intimacy with one another, and we know one another's collections, and so I think that really sort of eases the process of connecting our researchers with multiple places for multiple pieces of information. Thanks, James. Kevin. Yeah, just to add quickly to that, um, um, of course, we also wanna leverage technology when possible. So um, I think we all work to contribute to some of the same centralized databases. So like the Online Archive of California, uh, it consolidates um, the, the finding aids, the directories to our collections uh, in a one-stop search. The, and um, 
Similarly, things like Archives Grid can um, be very handy for researchers. Uh, so just kind of making sure that we're, we're participating in these common uh, technologies uh, that centralize access and discovery. Thank you, Kevin. We have a question here from Chris Reaney. How do we advocate for retaining analog original objects like books, sound recordings, and photographs? He writes that he just finished his MLIS, and it seems that there is little interest in keeping the originals once digital surrogates are made. Anyone? Heather Langto. Yeah, so I've actually been encountering this a little bit with donors. Um, there are donors who want to provide just digital copies of materials. And um, one of the ways that I try to have a conversation about that importance of the original, I mean, aside from the fact that, like some of you have expressed as a researcher handling that original, you can get a lot of information from just handling the original. But beyond that, technology for digitization and creating surrogates is always changing. I mean, I joke with them, but I say, you know, that photograph that we have, at some point we may be able to scan it and you might be able to have a hologram that you can interact with. I have no idea. But we don't know what the future holds for some of these surrogates. So having the original is really important for those reasons. Julie Thomas. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's an interesting and actually ongoing debate that's happening in our field right now. Um, and the answer is it depends. Um, I would always advocate to keep the original. That is the master. That's what we refer to it as. And yet if, if it's a film or a videotape that's disintegrating or is not safety film and it's combustible, that's an easy choice. You have to get rid of it. Or if there's no hardware anywhere. I'm looking at Matthias in the background. There's and a reel of nitrate right there. <laughs> there you go. And, you know, reel-to-reel -reel projectors. Mm -hmm. They're hard to find. So mm -hmm. do you keep them? Because if you do, then it's a matter of space is being taken up. Uh, you have to have the expertise to know how to fix hardware, software. Um, but that being said, is maybe I'm old school, is I always advocate to keep original, especially books or print material. Um, I, you know, that's a personal thing. And I think I don't want to speak for all my colleagues, but I would think that they would probably say the same thing too. If it wasn't becoming obsolete or destroying you know, or, or disintegrating something, you keep the original. Sebastian. Yeah, that's a great question. I highly recommend finding engaging anecdotes uh, when trying to advocate for retaining analog materials. Um, one of my favorite stories is how in the 1980s, the British government, in order to celebrate the 900th anniversary of the creation of something called the Doomsday Book, instituted a nationwide survey of school children to create, in a sense, a modern, up-to-date 1980s version of this famous census or survey of the nation. And the records that they generated um, can no longer be accessed because of the technology used is now obsolete. So there's no way that they can read these electronic records from the 1980s, whereas the original Doomsday Book from the 1080s, you can still open up and read. Um, so I, 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 some of my colleagues here at the State Archives, they um, teach courses to state records managers. And in, when they talk about this issue, they have a um, quote unquote prop they bring with them, which is an example of an obsolete uh, magnetic, magnetic media from the 1980s, which unfortunately I don't remember the name of it. Unfortunately, I don't have it with me right now in the office, but it looks like a computer disc that's probably 16 inches by 16 inches. I mean, this thing is so comically large. And I, it's, as far as I know, there are no machines that can read these uh, materials today. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of access and everything, but having great anecdotes to show how technology changes so rapidly, I think is a nice tool in our toolkit for making that that case. 
this is a, a, a great issue because as you preserve and digitize documents, every 10 years you have a new level or ability because of technology to do it again in a, perhaps a finer or a better way. And so all of that preservation work then has to be done again. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you guys are up to the task, I can tell. Uh, you certainly have the passion in the right place. Now, here is a question that's come in that, that may take us till next Thursday to answer properly, uh, but we will soon wrap this up so we can return to our lives and this then we will become history ourselves. <laughs> but the question is, and it comes from Dory Meyer, what is your greatest concern for the future of archives? Heather Langto. It may not be my greatest concern, but it's definitely one of the concerns that has surfaced for me um, in the last couple of years as we did a facilities renovation for the Yolo County Archives. And that is kind of the environmental impact of our facilities. So a lot of us have HVAC units that produce a lot of, you know, they need a lot of energy to be able to cool our collections the footprint that we need um, to store our collections, um, you know, the energy that goes into everything that we do. And I think that, you know, with the climate issues that we're having all over the world, that's definitely one of the, the, the issues that I see for us. Thank you, uh, Heather. Julie Thomas. What I worry about is, um, is being able to capture everything we need to in the future. Um, it's evolving what is information is evolving, um, what it's defined, how we understand it. And that's really the basic job of an archivist is to you know, identify records. A record can be you know, any evidence of something that happened at the time an event occurred. Um, but you know, how do you capture information from blockchains? where a computer is talking to a computer? How do you capture evidence uh, for somebody who's using their mind? You know, now there's mm -hmm. technology where people are using their mind mm -hmm. to do computer work. That's information, that's evidence of an activity, but how do we capture it? And yet I think we have to start thinking about it now because we're seeing it. That's what worries me is that we're not, we can't stay ahead of the eight ball. Sue Tyson. Um, for me, those things obviously very true. Um, also just um, that we're capturing all of the history, well, all of it, at least even a, a portion of the history that's locked up in people's basements or that is um, has yet to see any sort of official or documented light of day. Um, that's a lot of history that's lost all the time. And then also smaller archives. Um, I think it was Kevin that was talking about actually post um, custodial archival work and actually supporting um, smaller archives, community archives. So many go under. Um, and so without support, um, that will continue to happen. And that's just a huge loss, um, especially of voices that tend to be underrepresented in the first place. Um, so that's a danger I see. Thank you, Sue. Sebastian. Well, I think the easy answer is born digital records and the digital dark ages, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and make a different argument. I think that in my, prejudiced opinion, society is moving but for better or for worse towards a society where we emphasize the visual rather than the written. And I think that social media drives that to some extent. I think that that will in some ways benefit archives that have a lot of AV materials or photographic materials, but I, I fear for the written word. Um, but hopefully I'm wrong. <laughs> I hope so too. You know, this has been a lovely discussion. I, I have just uh, just a few things to say. First of all, I want to thank Kim Hayden behind the scenes at the Center for Sacramento History, who has been jockeying all of our questions coming in. 
Uh, we did get to as many of them as we possibly could, but we've run over quite a bit. I have one more question for my panelists uh, in just a moment, but again, this has been the live Meet the Archivist, part of the Sacramento Archives Crawl. My name is Matthias Bombal. I've been delighted to be your, your jockey or your ringmaster for this marvelous collection of intelligent and dedicated people working very hard to make sure that our past does not fully vanish. I remember as a kid always being so excited about learning something new about something old. And we can still do that each and every day. The first time I went searching for information was at the Sacramento room of the Sacramento Public Library where Tom Tully was very encouraging to me, 13 years old, 14, 15 years old, eager to learn about the theaters in Sacramento. And later when I started to manage the Crest Theater in 1986, I was there every day researching and learning and that wonderful curiosity, when you see it in someone, I'm sure I can certainly speak for our archivists, when you see that need to learn, it's more than a joy to help people out because that's why we do uh, what we do in our lives. So I'd like to take this opportunity, not only to thank you all for joining me, but ask if you have any closing thoughts before we sign off for tonight. Kevin Miller. Uh, I'll go first. Um, first, I wanted to thank you, Matthias, for doing such an excellent and able job of uh, monitoring you. and, and um, you know, steering this conversation. It's been a real pleasure. Um, I guess just let's just all remember uh, the, the human aspect of the work that we do, um, both with our the people we work with uh, and the community that comes in to use, use our collections and uh, access our material online. Um, just something to never lose sight of. Thank you, Kevin. Sebastian. Well, I think I think my motto is the number of interesting dead people is greater than the number of interesting living people. <laughs> so that's my final thought. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Heather Langto. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you, Matthias, as well for your um, hosting this this evening. And I also wanted to let everybody know who's. Um, listening in. If you have any questions, I don't want to speak for everybody on, on the panel, but I'll speak for myself. Please feel free to reach out. Um, we are, we love our profession. We love talking about our profession. And um, especially if you're interested in volunteering or interning or whatever, um, we, we would love to give you more information. Thanks so much, Heather. Julie Thomas. And I guess my final thought is what's um, fascinating about archives, amongst many other things, is that they are repositories of truth. I mean, there were primary sources that were created at the time an event occurred, correct? An email, a diary. But what makes it so fascinating is that we, inter you know, our users, our researchers, our scholars, our general public, they get to interpret it as they see, as they see. So here it is they get to interpret it. And that's what makes it so exciting um, is because history is always two sides or three sides or four sides of a story. Um, so again, I invite everybody to come into our archives. We're open Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, if you need anything, please, or if I can answer any further questions, I'm Julie Thomas at Sacramento State University. And thank you as well, Matias and Kim. Thanks so much, Julie. And now Sue Tyson. Um, I just wanted to say, yeah, anything that you're interested in, treat yourself to looking around to seeing what we might have to offer about that, because you'll probably be surprised at the ways that we can kind of blow your mind with what else <laughs> we probably have out there and how eager we are to make sure you know about it. <laughs> That's great. James and thank Scott. you, Matthias and oh. Kim. You guys are awesome. Thank you. James. Yeah, um, Matthias, you're fantastic. Thanks so much, Ever the Gentleman. Great job. Um, it's a good life being an archivist and working in the archives and working with such great colleagues. Um, so those of you that are out there and you're looking at our profession as an option, um, it's a good way to go. It's a good way to go. Um, Final plug, Sacramento Room is open. Um, we're open from one to six every day of the week. 
except for Sunday, Monday, and Friday. We've missed you. Please come back. Can't wait to see you. Very good. Thanks a lot, James. Uh, William, did you have any closing remarks? No, no closing remarks. I, your, his mic's up. All right. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. These are our archivists, and you have met them from the wonderful repositories in the greater Sacramento area. And they really are treasures. And I encourage you to enjoy them all with such talented people who can steer you into finding that one detail you never thought you might. It's very exciting when you do find it. And these are the stewards of history that'll make it possible. On behalf of the Sacramento Archives Crawl and the Center for Sacramento History, who kindly asked me to moderate, this is Matthias Bombell bidding you a very pleasant evening. And remember, everything becomes history at some point. Savor it. Good night. Good night.